the Arab Spring, uh, Libya, Egypt, Tunisia, all toppled. What was different about Syria and Bashar al-Assad uh, that uh, worked differently? Well, I think it was his response to the protests. Um, uh, in Tunisia, Ben Ali leaves, and uh, there's a you know a reasonably successful transition. Libya descends into civil war, but isn't suppressed in the same way that um, um, the protests were in Syria. I mean, he polarized the situation from the very beginning. He, you know, Bashar Assad is a you know was part of a paranoid regime that knew that they were next. You'd seen Mubarak go. You'd seen. Um, uh, Gaddafi go and uh, he doubled down and made it a military conflict and then polarized it further by um, facilitating um, a Salafist uprising in his own country. Arguably Syria is the worst of the Arab Spring countries in terms of uh, civilian death, uh, death rate. Um, it, it came at the end so it may be that Assad saw what had happened to the other rulers and thought I can't negotiate at all because then I'll be toppled. Also, he had a very powerful sponsor in Iran, and he had Hezbollah at his disposal to fight with. And eventually, he had the backing of Putin. So that allowed Assad to remain in power, whereas had he not had those supporters, he may well have been toppled. So, so it really became down to uh, Assad or it's either going to be my way or fuck the rest of you. Was that it? Well, he's a bad guy, and he created some really bad guys. So let's talk about how, how this thing just mushroomed. You know, first it starts with an uprising. How does an uprising go turn into a civil war? So it started with a, the, the revolution in Syria started with a series of protests in Dera. And then those protests in Dera quickly moved up the backbone of the country to Homs, to Hama, to Aleppo, and to many other towns. So they were initially protesting about um, uh, civil rights and, and equality and some fairness. And it, it, it mutated quickly into calls for the president to, to abdicate. At that point, uh, even before that point, the protests were being violently suppressed by the army and these local thugs called Shabiha. And they were shooting into the crowd, they were arrest people, they were, they were just pulling people off the streets. And that's where the FSA started to um, uh, emerge from the um, Assad army and air force. They started to defect and they started to shoot back at the uh, army. So now you have a, you know, an armed conflict and that rapidly grew into the civil war. And more, more generally, um, all of the Arab Spring countries started as protests against corruption and oppression. They were, the, the people of these countries had completely reasonable democratic demands. Uh, and they were met in every case, but particularly in Syria, they were met with gunfire, with machine gunfire in the streets of their own cities and towns. If you do that to a people, if enough, if enough people die, if there's no other alternative, eventually the populace will arm itself and fight back. And that's what happened in Syria. And then you have an escalation. And in some countries, the escalation resulted in the toppling of the regime. Uh, with Assad, he had such powerful backers uh, that he was able, barely, but he was able to resist being toppled. Can you discuss how uh, this situation where, which, uh, so all the, all the uh, rebels had was money coming from outside countries, like from the Gulf. Can you explain how, how, it, how this translates in, into more, more violence? Well, um, initially, they, before there was any outside influence in the war, uh, they, uh, local uh, uh, militias would form and then uh, attack the police stations or local army barracks and arm themselves that way. Um, then they would have some military success. There was a proliferation of cameras early in um, uh, 2012, these uh, smartphones, and these were used to document military success, and that was used as marketing tools in the Gulf to create um, uh, for fundraising. So... Let's talk about ISIS, which, which, which comes in later. Um, they, um, first of all, let's go move a little bit to the Iraqi invasion. How did the invasion of Iraq uh, sort of contribute to creating ISIS? Uh, well, the American military uh, invaded Iraq in 2003 
really shattered that society, introduced an enormous amount of violence into Iraqi society, made violence normal, made the sight of dead bodies on the streets normal in Iraqi society, uh, and installed a Shia government in Baghdad that quickly began, op began oppressing and tyrannizing this, the Sunni population. And eventually, um, the Sunni population had to defend itself. In addition, there was a debathification, the Ba'ath Party of Saddam Hussein. Um, there were a, a, tens of thousands of totally ordinary people who had to be part of the Ba'ath Party just to be in the military, to, be, to have jobs. All of those people were expelled from government, and, and they really had nowhere to go but to join an insurrection. And eventually, al-Qaeda in Iraq came in to protect the Sunni population, and after al-Qaeda in Iraq, ISIS came in to protect the Sunni population, and that very quickly uh, moved into Syria during the Civil War. ISIS then becomes, explain how ISIS then becomes almost an ally of the Syrian regime against the, against the rebels. Um, well, the, the Syrian regime um, chose not to fight the Islamic State because um, as far as the West goes, they're not a viable alternative of government. So if they can eliminate the, um, the secular rebels, um, then they're, they're, that, that's their real enemy in this scenario because the secular rebels would actually present a viable form of government for, for Western um, uh, governments. So. That's why he. That's why the Islamic State was allowed to proliferate and Jabhat al-Nusra to a certain extent. Um, so this, um, you know, your film really gets into this. I, this notion. I mean, you really look at uh, the Islamic State, and it, and and it really is little more than a criminal enterprise. I mean, can, can we can you talk about that? Absolutely. The the is the the Islamic State in Iraq was a mutation of Al Qaeda in Iraq, but it was run by a group of former military and secret police officers from the Iraqi army um, and that had been debathified and were basically unemployed. So they came out um, and had these intelligence tactics and knew that they needed to fundraise in order to become a viable um, uh, organization. So they did everything they possibly could to raise funds. So they would sell oil where they could. And these had existing smuggling networks. These people knew exactly how this worked beforehand. They mined antiquities on an industrial scale. They used kidnap and, um, uh, you know, there's even uh, some discussion about the extent of organ harvest by the Islamic State. And it's absolutely true that the Islamic State is basically a criminal, criminal cartel um, but let's put it in the context of the fact that the oppressive regimes in the Middle East are also criminal cartels. They, they call themselves governments, um, but basically they're criminal cartels that serve to further their own inter interests in terms of power and money. And they, they're, only in, in a nominal sense are they governments of the people. Well, aren't we slowly moving to that direction <laughs> in this country? I mean, <laughs> Well, well uh, in, in, in Western democracies, including America, there are extremely strong institutions that uh, buffer the country from um, individuals who want to change the rules to, be to benefit themselves personally. But corruption is, is like global warming, it, like global warming, right? It's, it's one, of, one of our biggest problems, and it's, it's, it's endemic in the West as well, is it not? Uh, if you look, if you look at a map and you overlay the the areas that have seen the the, the fastest rise in surface temperature, it's almost an exact um, representation of the areas of the world that are seeing armed conflict right now. And my guess is that if you looked at a, if you had a map that showed the areas, the countries with the worst corruption, you would also effectively see a map of violence in the world. I mean, you could also um, point to the. Uh, drought in Syria being uh, um, polarizing the country further because uh, there was food shortages, there was definitely water shortage for farmers, and that creates an enormous amount of frustration when you know corruption is already an issue. And, um, you have some amazing footage, some of it very disturbing, but it's, it's, it's I mean, this is the real thing, it's the war. How close did you personally get to it? So I took you know, a lot of trips to the region, to Turkey, to Jordan, to Iraq, and then all around Europe. But um, we did, um, on the last trip to northern Iraq, we basically went to the 
as basically to the edge of the world as far as, you, as civilization goes, because the next, you can see the front line, you can see the black flags, and you know that at that point there is no more, um, yeah, there's no more Mr. Nice Guys if you're looking north. So, I mean, that's just, you know, I don't know how, far, how much further, you, I don't think a Western journalist could have gone any further. The big problem in making this film was that going into Syria as a Western journalist um, was basically a suicide mission. Uh, journalists were being kidnapped and, and, and beheaded on video, on, uh, on video um, and it just wasn't worth it. So what we had to do was basically have proxy shooters within Syria that we were working with. We had Syrians, very brave Syrians, including the family that we documented, the family that became refugees into Turkey. Um, who were able to document the war for us. And we worked very closely with them, giving them shooting instructions and, and thematic instructions. And we, we basically had to um, shoot this film from across an international border, working with people in Syria. Such a big enterprise. This, you, this film is a big enterprise. Uh, what did you actually set out to do in the very beginning before this came about? Uh, initially, what we wanted to do was make a film that explained how the Syrian civil war got its start, why it became so vicious, and how ISIS came out of that situation. We also wanted to humanize it. We wanted to show the, um, what daily life was like in Syria, in the different areas, um, for the majority of people who are good people, uh, who are just trying to survive a terrible situation. Um. You had some amazing footage from France. Uh, you, 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 go, you have some footage of a, of, a, of a hit, actually. You're seeing the whole scene through the eyes of an of a, of a, um, ISIS hitman. Can you explain how you got that footage? Um, what was that? Can you explain? Well, um, well, he's not an ISIS hitman. Mohammed Mehra is was an Al-Qaeda-trained jihadist uh, who, in um, the spring of 2011, went on a killing rampage, killing uh, uh, several paratroopers and then uh, killing parents and children at a Jewish school in Toulouse. Um, so it's a very complicated scenario. The reason we use that footage is that it's the only time that you've seen jihad in the first person. Um, you see the cold and calculated and evil nature of what someone does um, and then puts it in the context of, it feels like a video game, but you, you understand how devastatingly precise and uh, ruthless he was. How did you get your hands on that footage? Um, that's a long and complicated question. Are there a lot of long and complicated questions about footage in the film? Or, or <laughs> yeah. You have some great stuff. I mean, it's... Yeah. The rest of the film is much uh, is much clearer about how we went to commission the film. We built a network of journalists. We um, um, uh, we shot a lot of the film ourselves. You know, there's a lot of interviews that we did, both that are in the film and we used for um, uh, research. The whole episode in France sort of shows how the violence is and uh, this personalized jihad is uh, is is moving. West, it's, it's 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 not with ISIS with their with their with their country being gone with the land gone. Um, talk about how it's spreading throughout the, the world. Yeah, there's two um, there's two challenges here. One is to defeat ISIS on the ground in Syria and Iraq, and they're absolutely amoral, violent, savage organization that should be eradicated. Uh, the world would be better off without them. But then there's the ideology of ISIS. It's a radical ideology and it's extremely violent like all radical, well, like most radical ideologies uh, of, every, of any religion. <clears throat> um, and the trick is how do, you, how do you fight that ideological battle and convince people living in Western cities, Western capitals in, in America, in Europe, convince them not to take what they consider justice into their own hands and go out and kill some people. Because killing people from the streets of a, uh, civilians on the streets of a Western country is extremely easy to do. So how do you fight that ide ideological battle? 
the starting with Mohammed Merah, who was wearing a um, a camera on his uh, on his uh, helmet or on his on, on his chest. Um, he, he, he had a body camera on, I guess much like police do now in the United States. And so what you see is murder in the first person. I mean, he filmed himself. You see the hand coming out and the pistol shooting. Um, so starting with Mara, uh, Europe has experienced far more devastating terrorist attacks by attackers like Mara than the United States has. And one of the theories for why the United States has been protected, has been buffered, from those kinds of attacks in the last few years is that the Muslim population is way more integrated in American society, into the American economy, the American culture, than the Muslim population in Europe is. And, that, and, and it, it could be that the ultimate protection against these kinds of terror attacks on our streets uh, is not waging war in a foreign country, it is actually being inclusive in our home country, and that may be the ultimate protection.